Well, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Southern California Caucus for Women in the Arts for inviting us all to be a part of an exhibition called Embed, I'm sorry, Common Ground at Embed Gallery in the San Fernando Valley. The show is very beautiful and I hope that you all will visit it. You can see it virtually or you can, by appointment, go visit the gallery itself. The exhibition, Common Ground, contains many artists, but tonight we're going, we've invited Mariana Vargas, Pilar Castillo, Nada Oslin, and Pamela J. Peters to be a part of a panel called What Inspires Artists to Create Socio-Political Images and Why Are These Images Important? So I'm very excited for tonight's conversation. I think it should be a very hot conversation because the artists that we've invited are very committed to socio-political image and have a great deal to say in their work. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite each one of these artists in alphabetical order to present their works through a little slideshow that I've prepared. And that way you can get to know them and get to know the images that they create. And when you go to the exhibition, whether it's virtual or uh, by appointment at the gallery, you'll be able to recognize the artists and connect them with their work. So if you'll allow me a moment, I'm going to uh, share my screen once again and start a PowerPoint presentation. And of course, our first speaker tonight will be Mariana Barkas. Please begin, Mariana. When it's your oh, turn. Hi, everyone. I'm Mariana Barkas, and I cannot see the images that are going come to come to on the screen. I don't see anything. Oh, I know. There's one more slide that I need to share with them first. Yeah. Thank you, Mariana. So we can okay. just go to that. Oh, okay. Then I can go see to my that. Uh -huh. There's one more slide that I me meant to share with everyone first. Yes. Please excuse me. We're also going to be asking the artists some questions that are really that they themselves wrote, which are very important. Can socio-political art image change culture and society? How are you able to maintain visibility as an indigenous artist in a large city like Los Angeles? Who owns the narrative? Does one need to be clearly identified with the community that one is working with or documenting? Or can one be an ally and make work with integrity? And lastly, what is your process? Where do your ideas come from? And how do you make them an artistic reality? There you go, Mariana. Hi, everybody. I'm Mariana Barkas, and for over 40 years, I've used image and text, often laced with humor, to express social and political commentary. My ongoing illustrated history project chronicles and, and many important issues and some of the absurdities of contemporary American life. Human technology presents a hopeful alternative to the human downgrading that results from the rapid growth of technology without paying attention to its harmful effects. Public health crisis addresses the stranglehold the National Rifle Association has on gun control. Guns are now the third leading cause of death for children in the US. The AMA and the American Academy of Pediatrics have joined forces to overturn 20 year old legislation that blocks gun violence research. The NRA continues lobbying to stop any gun research that could be interpreted as endorsing gun control. Next slide. Prisons for Profit looks at our burgeoning private prison industry. The U.S. has the world's highest per capita incarceration rate with a system that keeps more than 2.3 million people behind bars. Sadly, across America, many small towns see new prison complexes as the key to reviving a local economy because state and federal governments spend $74 billion annually on incarceration. Ah, the romance of the American road trip. The country is littered with toxic nuclear weapons waste sites, some of which the Department of Energy has opened as tourist attractions and parks. Officials claim that the still radioactive waste is safe for the public because it's entombed between thick layers of clay and rock. Local activists, however, say it's a ploy aimed at promoting public acceptance of nuclear waste as a normal part of our environment. When we consider warning people hundreds of thousands of years into the future about what's inside the Yucca Mountain nuclear dump, perhaps the only thing we can safely assume is that despite vastly different cultures and languages, they will still have our basic human bodily functions. Therefore, I suggest a giant turd sculpture as a universal warning sign. 
The role of toilet paper consists of newspaper clippings about nuclear waste from 1988 to the present. Appalled by the unfolding humanitarian crisis of the border, I collage newspaper articles together into this sculpture that resembles a child, adding razor wire after I saw pictures of US soldiers unrolling razor wire at the border and heard President Trump say, barbed wire used properly can be a beautiful thing. A Trump administration immigration policy that is in reality child abuse. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Pilar Castillo. My work is the Passport Project. The focus of my design practice grew into an interrogation of identity systems and visual narratives, particularly the branding of government issued documents that perpetuate a colonized identity. Documents that are then used to exclude and by extension criminalize the undocumented. This visual interrogation had been the focus of my work when in the fall of 2018, the world witnessed the humanitarian crisis at the US-Mexico border of Central American migrants seeking refuge and asylum. We witnessed the response of the Trump administration as they greeted refugees with military force, with no conscience for the fact that the president's own family were immigrants to this land. The, hypo the hypocrisy is that the US government refuses to recognize its own hand in the crisis that has impoverished Central America. So in the midst of the unfolding border crisis, I determined to make a counterfeit US passport that would then travel across borders and into Europe as part of a traveling exhibition that would introduce the Women's Salon LA Art Collective to our sister collectives in Paris and Mexico City. This was my own act of rebellion and response to the confrontation at the border. The counterfeit is designed to question the authenticity and challenge the authority of the official document. The nostalgia of colonial identity remains a narrative that is projected onto the pages of the official passport, featuring the iconic stone faces of Mount, of Mount Rushmore and Lady Liberty, along with pastoral images of wildlife and the Wild West. The visual display recorded in the travel document is an anesthetic to the historical trauma inherited by people of color. Instead of romanticizing a colonial past, the counterfeit passport is a counter narrative that recalls a history of slavery and exploitation from reservations to cotton plantations, boarding schools and internment camps and the ongoing abuse of migrant laborers and domestic workers. I am the daughter of a domestic worker we are Central American, and my mother crossed the border unapologetically over 40 years ago. Many of our families still bear the scars of this journey, the shame and injustice of the crossing. The act of counterfeiting the very object that validates citizenship is in effect a declaration that we will not remain invisible, nor will we be whitewashed out of history. The counterfeit US passport is a practice in decolonizing design and interrogating government narratives to dismantle the formats in which land is claimed and people discarded. These are only a few of the spreads from the passport. It's a 28 page booklet that I handmade and copied at Kinko's and Office Depot and had a number of iterations to get to this point. Thank you. Hey, um, hi everyone. Uh, this is Nada Osline. Um, this particular project, Gringotopia, was my first time actually working with video. Um, I've been mostly a photo-based artist working both in and out of the studio. Um, all my work has a relationship that typically combines documentary and fiction. And formally, my work is generally pretty spare and iconic. So visually, this piece being mostly talking heads against a black background relates to that. Um, originally, I thought of this piece as a multi-channel video installation. Um, but I knew that if I were to develop an installation, 
if, if it got shown, um, it would at the most be up for a limited time and for a very limited audience. So for me as an artist, it's been really empowering to offer this piece directly to the public on an ongoing basis. Uh, the platform's on Vimeo um, and has got like wonderful statistics. So to sort of see a worldwide audience grow over, it's been up for a couple of years, has been really uh, it's been really great. I mean, exciting for me. Um, I had a day job for about 20 years working for local government in high community contact positions. Um, and I left that job about 10 years ago. And at the time I swore I would actually never use the word community again, um, because in that context, I often saw it used as a word of exclusion. It was what the community didn't want. Um, so over time and through personal healing, this project was actually a return to dealing with more, more directly with ideas of community that's something I'd done much earlier in my life as an artist. Um, the title Gringotopia refers to a romanticized notion of being in another more perfect place. And I guess depending on how you see it, the word gringo may or may not be offensive. Um, so just a little bit about the project. Um, over two years, I went to Chapala, Mexico. It's about an hour bus ride from Guadalajara. Um, it's an area that attracts a lot of expats from the US and Canada. And at this point, those people are primarily uh, retirees. And so while I was there, I interviewed a total of 25 people um, and collected over 40 hours of material and then broke that material into sections that are woven together with the pacing of a social conversation. Um, the end result is a series of 12 10 minute videos or chapters you know, the piece doesn't take sides. I mean, the way I see it or have a conclusion about whether something is bad or good. Um, and I, I, I took myself out of it. So I'm not asking questions within it. Um, the fact that most of them left the US to seek a better way of life in Mexico, I saw as a reverse narrative to what many people here in the US think of when they think about Mexico or actually almost anywhere, really. Um, it contradicts the internalized myth that Americans have as the US as the best place in the world to live and that everyone would rather be here than anywhere else. And so for whatever reasons, those people originally decided to relocate, whether they were economic or climate, two of the biggest reasons. Um, after the newness of the experience wore off and they weren't on vacation anymore, um, a lot of them really began to see the values of the US that focuses on materialism and competition as not really working for them anymore. And I think, I mean, a lot of people leave the country um, and they're increasingly uncomfortable with what it has come to represent to the rest of the world. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. My name is Pamela Peters. I am Dene. I am living here on Tavangar, which is known as the original land base for the Tongva people. I just wanted to recognize them as the original land people um, of Los Angeles. And the work that I'm going to go over is actually about, um, it's a series that I created back in 2014. Um, this series gives a glimpse into the many cultures of American Indians migrating to metropolitan major cities. This one in particular was well structured by the US government. Um, and the, the project was, um, my, my entire work is actually talking about the, the difference and the the issues that we face as Native Americans living in in major cities and in th this photo it's called interculturality and this is a photograph I took at Union Station in Los Angeles and this is of a young lady who is mixed she's Lakota and Japanese she was dressed in her um, regalia and it just it talks about the different cultures of what we have in Los Angeles. Um, Oh, we're going pretty fast here, sorry. Um, this image is um, called Indians in the City, and it's a collection of Native Americans living in Los Angeles, California. This photo is of Cheyenne Phoenix. She is of Navajo, she's Navajo and Paiute. And the series is in response to a collection of photos that Edward Curtis took, and it's done in a sepotype finish to counter what he has projected with his photography throughout the years. And going back to what I was talking about with Legacy of Exile Indian, it was, um, this project is um, a neorealism 
like structured of photography that I took in response to um, a film that I saw um, back in 19 or 2008 um, the film was 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 made in 1961 it's called the exiles um, I can talk a little more about that when we get into our Q&A thank you hi everybody this is one of my new pieces this is Linda Vallejo speaking uh, this is called uh, this is the real thing and it's actually a data piece uh, it's a 24 inch tall coca-cola bottle that I painted brown put uh, in sort of uh, in, in Indigena Americana, Mexicana uh, imagery, it etched it actually across the bottle and filled it with 75 chocolate balls, uh, indicating that 75% of all new jobs before 2050 will be filled by US Latinos. This piece is a small uh, piece from the Make Em All Mexican series where I buy pricey antiques and paint their skin brown to appropriate culture, to appropriate history, to appropriate um, power and uh, wealth. This piece is called Make Em All Mexican Jaguar Nahuatl Tattoo, and it's actually of a very uh, well-known Victorian female form with a um, repurposed photograph of one of my own paintings. This is a COVID chair. It's actually a milk chocolate brown chair, once again, making them all brown, keeping them brown. 27.5% of all uh, COVID deaths in the United States, uh, weighted numbers, uh, where 27.5% of all deaths were U.S. Latinos in April 2020. And the cushion is a painted object where I draw a form, a geometric form, count the number of shapes in the form, and then paint the number of areas in that form to match the data that I'm trying to represent. This is one of my newer works. It's based on the politics of culture and the politics of power. And I'm basically talking about uh, and asking the questions, uh, where were the Mexican Americans, where were the, uh, the Mexicans, and where were the Tejanos at the turn of the century? Were, were we actually a part of the making of the American culture, the wealth of America? And the answer is yes. 70,000 to 100,000 workers on the railroads between Texas and California, uh, workers were used to build those railroads. Um, this, I believe, is the a piece of, it's a, another, what a Greek goddess whose skin once again is painted brown. And now there is a data piece on her back, which is a Dato Sagrados object, a circular object once again, much like the chair. And in this case, the data that's represented is that between 2010 and 2015, Latino college graduates grew by 40.6%. I painted just about every kind of individual brown at this point, including presidents and kings and queens. Mm -hmm. Um, Victorian objects such as this uh, beautiful brown bouquet. I, I scour uh, antique malls and purchase things from Americana and in that way uh, reverse history. I started out the project by looking for objects that represented um, Mexicans and Mexican Americans and indigenous people in the um, antique malls without any luck at all except for very small uh, salt and pepper shakers. Actually the very first piece I ever made was uh, a pilgrims, two little pilgrims. And I said, well, let's make them brown. So there we have it. Okay. Wow. Good. Heavily impressed. If everybody would unmute their mics now for me, please. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you all very much. The work is extremely powerful and very meaningful. I'm so happy that we're all here together today. So um, we're gonna discuss the inspiration, meaning, and uh, let me see if I can share my video again. There I am, hi. And you can see the Make Em All Mexican behind me. Uh, uh, the politics of color, class, culture, and gender. And so we, the artists, I invited the artists to come together and uh, ask some questions themselves after looking at each other's works. And I think that these questions are very powerful and very meaningful. Pilar, are you going to join us? Pilar, oh, there you are. So the first question, oh, Pamela, will you be joining us as well? Yes. There yeah. you are. So if you have an answer, simply raise your hand and then we'll just be polite to each other since we can all see each other on the screen now. My first question, my, this was actually my question, can socio-political art image change culture and society? Um, yes, Mariana. Uh, yes, I think socio-political art can change how we see the world and how we think about it. And maybe then 
uh, by that, it becomes a catalyst for change by reinforcing beliefs and letting people know that um, they're not alone and maybe even changing people's minds. But um, isn't that like what we're all working for in, uh, as humans, looking for meaning in our lives? And as artists, we're trying to make objects that um, translate that meaning into uh, into objects that uh, uh, speak to other people so they can um, understand what we're trying to tell them, our, our truth, whatever that is. Um, so, and I can see it in uh, all the recent demonstrations, all of the posters and the um, videos and the memes that really galvanized people and got them out in the streets, I think, added to it. I mean, they have plenty of reason to be out there. <laughs> Pilati, you're shaking your head. Do you agree with us? Certainly. I mean, even digital art, you know, and the effect of social media promoting different visual graphics that really impact and are ingrained in society that give you some interest and curiosity about what are these artists talking about? What does this work represent? You know, it kind of leads you into a whole thought process about what is being said here. And honestly, it works both ways, because if we look at what, you know, the Trump administration is doing with their graphics and messaging that is, you know, reaching some people and affecting them to take action in a negative way from my point of view. Right. So it absolutely has an effect and very important, like even, um, you know, technology and the Facebook revolution leading to the Arab spring and all of the work that we're putting out there really starts to grow feet and grow tender. I'm sorry, uh, Pamela. Pamela, you had your yeah, hand. yeah. I I believe it absolutely. Artwork can change the perception of a culture. Even just for me as a Dene artist, um, I'm generating contemporary photographic narratives that are redefining the perception of how people see Native Americans and American Indians are seen today. And as for as for the narrative itself, I'm rebooting the a reality of Native life rather than what we are taught about. A relic stereotypical Indian that has been transmitted into young minds through our education system, through films, through television, through advertisement, through mascots, and through popular culture, culture still seen today. And just even in my work, I'm showing aspects of that native life, that urban life, that's not necessarily reservation life. It's a part of the history of who we are. It's a political history. And even just with the, my, my project, Legacy of Exile Indians, the photography um, is about a part of our history that's not, not told. And then my second project that I'm doing with um, Real Indians Retake Hollywood, that title itself is a political statement. It's retaking, it's recreating um, these portraits of iconic movie stars from the golden era and giving a voice and a, a, a placement for actual Native Americans that Hollywood won't see. Um, we still see those remakes of Hollywood um, Western films that are depicting natives as relic Indians of the past. So yeah, I, I totally believe that. And that's the reason why I do the artwork that I do because I want to change that demeaning stereotypical image. And I really want to get people to understand who we are as contemporary Native Americans. So yes, I do believe it is. Maida, would you like to chime well, in? Yeah, I think I took this question too literally because I kind of focused on this word of change and I was really inspired by everyone's work in many different ways because I spent a lot of time with your work and but I think it's a really complicated question and um, I, I guess I would probably make the distinction between studio-based work that gets shown in a gallery um, which I think uh -huh. has impact uh -huh. and um, social practice work where there's like a deeper involvement in a community at best um, you know non non-exploitive mm -hmm. social practice work but you know I I think to make something that doesn't have a designated um, practical purpose in a consumer society is in itself a radical act and, and a proclamation of your humanity. So even if the result is only the transformation that you go through as an artist, I think that that's valuable. But I also think that like for our work, I mean, I have like a ton of thoughts. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go through all my thoughts, but it's like, you know, trying to measure change in a, that a particular piece of visual art has on the culture, I think would be really difficult because it implies that it's like a quantifiable element that you have as a result of viewing a particular work of art. I think personally that maybe 
film, theater, literature has like the most potential to shake up people's belief mm -hmm. systems because it's an immersive experience over time. And I saw this piece at LACMA. I don't know if anybody saw this, but it was the virtual reality piece by Alejandro Inaratu. Um, mm -hmm. And basically uh, you were alone in a gallery um, with the museum staff and suddenly you were in the desert with a group of people that were migrating from Mexico. And you know, there were helicopters and immigration and people, mm -hmm. somebody pointing a gun at you. And it was mm -hmm. a very frightening experience. And I didn't, I did not shake that experience off. And, um, you know, I think, I still think about it. It put you right in, right in the position of having an acceptance. So for me, that was like a recent piece I saw where I was like, wow, I feel really transformed by that. Um, and, and I mean, another example, can I go on or I don't want to, yeah. That's I have one more example. Yeah. So because I have too many thoughts, but, um, you know, I was also thinking about sort of the social practice work and, and there was a project in 2009 at the hammer. I don't know if anybody's, I mean, it's a long time ago, but it was this flattened taxi cab that this artist Jeremy Diller did. And it was a flattened taxi cab from Baghdad. And what he did is he took this flattened taxi across the country and set it up in public spaces. And he had an, like an Iraqi American and then a veteran. And so the entire piece of work was about the conversation that took place place around this. And so interestingly enough, and I'm interested in this too, was criticized for not being art enough, being too yeah. education or like the D yeah. word didactic, yeah, yeah. but activists would criticize it for not being activist enough because it mm -hmm. sort of didn't take a point of view. So anyway, I just think that those kinds of things are interesting um, in terms of impact. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that you brought it up because when I asked the question, because this was my question, uh, I know that creating sociopolitical work has changed me personally. And I know that it has a potential of bringing a new light to other people about the way that they see about see Latino Americanos or Native Americans or the political situation. But my question really was, can it change? And that's the first word you said, Neda, was can it change it? And then the second thought that I had also, it, it, does it really change? Because this is a, this is a difficult, uh, uh, what, uh, this is a difficult point for artists who really want to make sociopolitical work. Is it actually having an impact, which might be a better way to say it. And then secondly, my, my point was the whole bit about that. I was going to ask right now, I just wrote it down. Are you finding that curators, historians, and scholars are interested in the sociopolitical imagery that you're creating, which is part of the web that needs to be created to actually impact and have change? Mariana? I'd just like to speak to the idea of change. <laughs> yeah, I get it emotional. Um, so many times I feel like I'm, I'm uh, 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 preaching to the core because people, you know, that they, they're on my side and they know all this stuff and we've exchanged ideas. Uh, but then uh, I'll go to an uh, exhibit that has some of my work in it and somebody will, a total stranger will come up to me and say, you know, I never thought about that. Or I, um, I'm, I'm going to show this to somebody who really needs to find out about this information. Or they'll take a, a, a photo and say, can, I'm going to put it on my Instagram feed. Can I do that? You know, it's fine. Go ahead. So it's like, um, I'm sure everybody's had that experience. Somebody come up to them and say, wow, that really changed my whole perception. Even though, you know, so far and few between, it's kind of like being a teacher. Uh, you put all that stuff out. And maybe years and years later, people are still remembering you, but you don't know it. <laughs> Any more thoughts, ladies? Um, yes. Sure, Pamela. I, th I think in order for real change to happen, we need more artists doing these like really political mm -hmm. statements of, of artwork and to provide more platforms and more distribution. But yeah, right. we're... we're we're such a marginalized group of people that it's difficult to share our work. Um, just even my work, I, I do get it. It, it, it gets shared among, um, you know, people that are really wanting to understand the, the, the psychological like experience of what Indians have gone through, but that's a small group of people. Yeah. But if we get more people that will do this kind of work, then yes, I definitely think there, there can be change. And if we get, you know, opportunities for more platforms to discuss this. There yes. Platforms is what I want, really want to talk about, Nada. 
I just wanted to say that that was a huge motivation because mostly I've shown work in, you know, galleries and nonprofit spaces or whatever. And it was a big motivation for me to do Gringotopia. It was a huge game changer for me because I felt like I could get my work directly out mm -hmm. to the public. And that, that, I mean, it is problematic to always have kind of have it in the context of the gallery. Um, I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm not devaluing it because I, you know, no. I mean, make them all Mexican. That's like, there's like such an incredible like simple beautiful like complete like just it's perfect actually well so. my experience has been that galleries this has been my experience in, in terms of galleries is that galleries are a business and they must sell to a collectorship okay. and you actually have to find a, a gallery that has a socio-political point of view and they are out there but oftentimes galleries have to mix a socio-political point of view artists with other artists that produce different kinds of works because they, 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 they speak to many different kinds of people. They sell, they, their market is to many kinds of individuals. And finding that gallery is a matter of research and actually reaching out, literally just reaching out and contacting galleries that you think might be interested in your work and getting a little bit of a tough skin about it, knowing that it's gotta be a good fit. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then the, what I found, but what I did find is that universities and regional museums and national museums are very much interested in socio-political statements. And that takes a little bit more courage, but it's basically the same process of just of reaching out and sharing quality portfolios of work to be able to get the, the word out. But if we're looking towards galleries, it's a harder, it's a, if you'll excuse the, the pun, it's a harder sell. But uh, what, universities, colleges, and regional museums would be more, are more likely to give women solo exhibitions. Pamela, you had something you wanted to say, or Pilar? Um, no. I wanted to point out that you know when I made the passport, it was for an internal group of people, this collective that I was part of, and never expected that it would have so much traction, right? And so I got a lot of response, both positive and negative, from people saying, you know what, thank you for telling our story. We relate to this and you know, we, we tear up. And other people that were like, well, then why don't you go back to your country? You know, the obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I got, I got all kinds of different responses. And, and then ultimately it got featured in an article and also that started to generate some you know talk and i think that that's exactly what we're aiming for here is to spark a conversation right to strike that that fire so um i also got approached by some uh, academics who would want to turn it into curriculum and that's the crazy part is like, okay this really isn't in our curriculum you yeah. know mm -hmm. and so it just opens up a pandora's box yeah, scholars are very interested in this stuff. Scholars yeah. and educators. Pilar, um, Pamela, you had something you wanted to say? Well, just even my work, it's really like, it's, 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 it's being spread a lot to, um, throughout the education system. And also I do a lot of speaking engagements around universities. Oh, cool. And someone had just um, spoke about Art, art Change Us, our art. Um, it's an organization, Art, Arts for Change. Mm -hmm. um, I've done work with them as well, and they really are proactive in this kind of artwork. Mm -hmm. So, th I mean, to other artists on the panel, um, I would really advise you to like consider maybe looking out at them as well. I think that this conversation, answering this question and opening it up a little bit more is gonna be very helpful to the audience who's watching other women and men, of course, who are making socio-political image and are wondering uh, where they're going to find an audience for the work. And so I'm really grateful that we were able to unpack it a little bit. And we have enough time to be able to spend a few moments sharing questions and experiences to be able to unpack some of these questions. Does anybody have anything lastly they would like to say on this topic or I'll move to the next question? Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm sure Pamela was the one that that uh, presented this one. How are you able to maintain visibility as an indigenous artist in a large city like Los Angeles? Since it's your question, Pamela, why don't you answer it first? Um, well, it's it's really difficult. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's there's very it's very limited. Uh, there's it's I have very limited visibility with an audience with my work. Um, just the fact of people not really you know, believing or understanding American Indian culture. Um, I get 
misidentified quite frequently. Um, people think I'm Latino, Italian, Filipino, everything else. And then if I tell them I'm Native American, there's some doubt, um, which really is, 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 it's sad, but it's also problematic because it really um, pushes against what I'm trying to do. And if anything, I'm trying extremely hard, harder now, more frequently, as opposed to when I first started um, my, my, my work. But um, it's, it's, it's very difficult because I do get pigeonholed into this um, idea of what an Indian artist is. And I do quotes because um, when people say Indian artists, they think of a traditional like painter, or silversmith, rug, you know, maker, um, things that um, are kind of crafty art. And that's not what I do. Mm -hmm. um, my work is very different and it's very hard to um, be visible in Los Angeles when my work, when, when I live in a, in the mecca of media that really has like dismissed our, our identity and have like objectify our existence through films and through advertisement. And so it's, it, it is very difficult, um, but I, you know. So, so I want, I'm sorry. Okay, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, do it, do uh, Neda, Mariana, Pilar, do you feel that you are also isolated uh, and stereotyped? Can you well, relate to well, what Pamela is saying? Well, you know, I just had questions actually. I mean, it made me wonder, um, you know, how does anybody maintain visibility in <laughs> the world that has such a quick turnaround? And like, sure. you know, what is visibility? Or like, who are you visible to? And then also- I'm like, visible I know, as a human being. <laughs> That's what no, I'm trying I, to say. Like, of course, but like I go in and out of social media, like I'm completely pretty much off of social media at the moment because I like, sometimes I'll just spend like too much time on it and it would just seem really like superficial to me. I guess visibility means maybe it does. I mean, reviews, is it a gallery show? Is it an interview on a podcast? Is it speaking? And then, you know, and then I guess probably most importantly, what do we do with our visibility if we have visibility for a moment in time, <laughs> for whatever moment in time we have it for? Well, I think when I, when I brought that question up about visibility, it's more about really seeing who we are as Native Americans as human beings, because we're not being seen as human beings. We are... Um, totally dismissed from that. We're like, okay, well, what? It, it's you, you, you take that that trying to understand who we are as Native people. It always branches off to other questions, and we forget that what I'm asking is just accept us. We're here. We're human beings, and don't objectify us. Um, or you know, think that we don't exist. Don't don't listen to us, yeah. listen to our native issues, listen to our history, listen to our contemporary stories, um, you know, quit demeaning us as stereotypical objects that can be objectified. And it's a struggle. It's a struggle every day. Nada? I just, we all have need to relearn history in this country. I mean, we were taught the most you know, ridiculous history I was growing up. And um, I mean, it's got to be frustrating for you to, mm -hmm. I mean, to have this history that's so recent and then to have to be stereotyped in this way. I mean, it's just, it's really unconscionable, really. Pilar, you had something you wanted to say? Certainly. I wanted to say that Pamela's work to me at this point is very iconic because it, it just stands for centuries of becoming present. Right, and when you speak about um, creating this work as a response to the Edward Curtis collection of basically anthropological, very staged um, imagery from the mid 19th century, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's very powerful to see this work now to see that that uh, Native American people are being represented at, of the moment, contemporary, and not in this relic of the past. You know, mm -hmm. not as like not what has been the major nostalgia of like romanticizing the Indian um, American Indian, you know? Yeah. Mariana, you had your hand up too? Yes, I want to thank Pamela for this, for her work, because it's very touching. And, 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 but, you know, there are 
uh, was it Monday was supposed to be Columbus Day, and now it's actually been switched over to uh, by many cities to uh, Native, uh, what is it, Indigenous National people. National Indigenous people. So it's like it may, it's kind of a feeling that maybe this, there is some visibility and some recognition of this. Uh, but on the other hand, you have the Trump administration and my beloved or not president talking about uh, there's actually a legislation being in, in, uh, uh, introduced about the, the true American history going back to that crap that we were raised with instead of letting the, um, the, actual, the actuality, the truth come, come out. Uh, they're actually um, trying to hold on to that. They're holding on for dear life because they, they, um, they're going to, you know, those, those old white guys are going to go. They, they are on their last legs. Well, this, this Pamela, this, what this brings to me is that, you know, Latin Americans are oftentimes invisible. Uh, we're everywhere, but we are invisible. Um, we are seen as uh, unskilled workers. That's been our name for the last few hundred years here. And actually we are a part of the essential workers and that's one of my new uh, conversations. We are now essential workers, which I'm hoping if, uh, if enough of us use this language that we can change the way people see us. And one of the tools that I've used to be able to uh, create a situation where we can no longer be invisible is through the data that I, like I presented through my work. I've been doing a lot of data work for the last about five years now, where I've actually done a great deal of research on where Latinos are, where Latinos are today, where they're gonna to be tomorrow, where they were, well, now I'm doing all the research on the 19th century to find out were we actually a part of the making of the United States and the making of the American, the North American culture? And we were, we've been here for a very long time and uh, uh, I can prove it with data. And somehow or another, being able to speak about data as numerically, you know, as, as, as a number, as a, as, a, as a reality, has seemed to help with my, in my own work in convincing people that Latinos should not be considered invisible or treated as if they are invisible or treated as if they're, they're all uh, unskilled workers with nothing to add to the culture. Possibly that would um, provide some little food for thought in terms of presenting your work so that people would feel differently about it, differently about Native American people and the, the great part that they played in the history of this, this nation. Yes, Mariana. And the crimes against the Native Americans in our, I mean, when you think of, of, of the forced marches across the country and oh, people yeah. being forced to um, give up everything. And then I don't know if yeah, you all know this book, uh, where is it? I, I guess I can't not get a picture, can the camera. <laughs> Or it's in history of people's history of the United States that should everybody should be reading this book and teaching it to people. And one of the things he quotes is, is Columbus's um, first uh, interaction with uh, with people he meets, and he says um, they were so friendly and happy and 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 welcoming, and and uh, they would make fine servants, and uh, we could subdue subject subjugate them. Uh, and make them do whatever we want. I mean, that is the whole attitude that was, and that we need to get that information out. Thank you so much, um, you know, for doing that uh, because um, there's so much to be done yet. Okay, I think this next Wait, question me, was, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, just one more thing. I just wanted to uh, say to Pamela that, um, I mean, this isn't content based, but um, those are just beautiful photos. And like, I like how they seem structured like film, film stills or location shots, and they kind of mimic this cinematic representation. And I really want to see that film, The Exiles. Um, and, um, and also just because you mentioned the people's history, also the like, and what you were doing with, um, um, with, with history is like the 1619 project is kind of amazing in the, in the New York Times about um, that, that the history of, of um, African Americans being brought over here um, and the contributions that they made from early on. And that people's, a people's book by Howard Zinn is pretty amazing too. So anyway, that's all I want to say. So shall we move on to the next question? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Mariana put this one forward. Who owns the narrative? 
Does one need to clearly identify with a community that one is working with or documenting? Or can one be an ally and make work with integrity? I thought this was a really fascinating question. Uh, it can be taken from many different angles. Who would like to take it on first? Actually, that was not my, my question. Who was it? Was it yours, Nita? No. It sounds like something, now that I, no, I think about it, Nita, yeah. So Nita, <laughs> why don't you take it on then? Okay. Oh, no, I would see. I only asked it because I was hoping all of you could answer it. <laughs> Are you grappling with this question, Nita? No, well, kind of, but I mean, I, you know, I guess overall, I was, I was thinking about, um, again, visual art in comparison to other media like film and literature where there's an immersive experience over time and where people clearly embody characters that they are not. And I think um, that novel American, there was a lot of conversation when I asked the question around that novel American Dirt. But, um, but you know, subsequently, like I have this whole page of thoughts, but actually today I was thinking a lot about um, the, the, like the, the talk about empathy. There's been a lot of talk about empathy. And I guess I understand that, um, that the term's been become like sort of problematic or being dissected sort of academically. And um, you know, I guess my feeling is like nobody really owns a narrative unless it's completely autobiographical, but it's never, that it's never possible to walk in someone else's shoes. And you know, I think that actually listening is, could be a form of empathy. I mean, um, or reading a, like a memoir of a firsthand experience that would work better. Like now there's all this like corporate training for empathy, which I don't think recognizes that we're emotional beings and that you really need to have a, an, an emotional response to something to understand it at that level. I remember when I worked for government, we would have these sexual harassment training <laughs> sessions. And it was like so funny because like, <laughs> Afterwards, like I really didn't think like say like the men that were supposed to probably hear the message like everyone like got really stiff and then they would say make these awkward comments and like I'm just imagining like kind of this empathy training in a mm -hmm. corporate setting as being like that. So I, 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 you know, I guess anything that fires up your curiosity about the experience of others uh, is a step in the right direction. Um, so that's what I thought about today and I, you know, I don't think I'll bother with the other things. <laughs> Well, it's a very fascinating question because you're really talking about appropriation. Well, right. yeah. Um, appropriation. I, I think this question, the question has so many layers to it. And I, for me, I can only address it the way I see it as a, as a Native person who's been marginalized and who has continued to see appropriation um, consistent from literally from the time I've, I've been a child. I think narratives need to have a culture significance needed to be held by that particular tribe. Um, I see it now like in the Southwest, a lot of those tribes um, in the last few decades have really taken a stand with controlling their stories and images. Um, for example, with my tribe, um, the, the, our name, the Navajo, um, it's trademarked and but we don't it's trademark where we control it and we can sue people that use it but we don't have the manpower to impose and sue everyone that uses it um i think some of the smaller tribes like my relatives from the hopi um, tribe they they really um control their stories and they they've seen how mm -hmm. um in past their their images and in their ceremonies have been um, appropriated and how um, d people have used their 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 images of as objects and have objectified these mm -hmm. these images throughout um, various different people's artwork and they don't like that and you can't really go to the Hopi tribe either because they there's science that says no photos and if they see you with a camera they'll destroy it and I've seen them do that mm -hmm. there's areas that I've gone to up in the villages on the high plateaus that nobody mm -hmm. can go to unless you're a tribal person mm -hmm. um, those are stories that I know of, but I would never like take it from them because they're, they're my relatives and that's their stories. They're, it's not my story. How does um, that, but how does that, how does that narrative that you just shared with us affect the way you make your art and affect the way you see other people's art in terms of owning the narrative? Because we don't just see images of, uh, we, we, appropriations everywhere, as far as I can tell. It's everywhere. Yeah. Everyone's appropriating everything from everywhere. 
but the narrative but the narratives are from my life experience um legacy of exile indians of relocation that's my life experience of my your, your particular gone, art yeah, my fa- yeah yeah my family has gone through that my parents went through relocation so i'm talking about their stories i'm talking about the history that mm-hmm. affected us mm-hmm. and then also with you know, the 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 um about um, the Hollywood images. I've seen my, my uncles play Indian in, in John Ford films. And I've uh, seen how mm-hmm. there's performative art. And I have a real problem with a lot of this performative art that I see um, throughout, not just with native artists, but with just, just artists in general. But that seems to be what people have been drawn to that whole romanticism that you know relic image that um these stereotypes that have been commodified through generations and generations and i i just think it needs to stop i think it you know i think sometimes we have lost respect for people and their stories i think sometimes we've lost respect of tribes and and cultures of their stories and i I, there you know there's we can get into like talking about cultural property and but that's a that's a legal term i really don't know about but that's part of how who controls these cultural um narratives and cultural property but a lot of you had something you wanted to add sure i um was thinking in terms of my work the passport project it's not a topic of interest for me. It's a lived experience, like Pamela was saying. It's a personal narrative. It's a painful narrative. And not only that it's my, me and my family's narrative, but shared by so many immigrants that are coming to the United States and dealing with the exploitation of all of the laborers that are you know in the in the United States from Japanese to uh, the Chinese history to African American history? I mean, it covers all of our people here in the United States, and and you know a major part of uh, conflict that I had in doing this piece was really thinking about who would be the bearer of this passport, and inevitably I chose the image of one of the Edward Curtis images of one of the Hopi young women who was looking away from the camera and that in itself is supposed to represent a rejection of this American identity right it's supposed to it's supposed to be the counter narrative to what we are constantly being fed as what is American Mm -hmm. so it's part of it's 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 really a fascinating question like you said Linda because Mm -hmm. It's, it's as much my story as it is everybody's story. A lot of people's story that are here yeah. in the United States. Can I, can I just tell you something? I, I did find, um, I find that, I found that a little problematic just because that image is actually a relative of my relatives. And if you understand what Edward Curtis was doing with a lot of his images, he took photos and he imposed himself on these lands and took photos with people without really acknowledging them. And so I know that she is an iconic like image, which I don't like seeing and I don't like native people even using that image, but she has been used all over and she has been objectified. And it really is hurtful. Um, especially talking to my Hopi relatives. And they're like, that's why we don't let people come to our villages. That's why we have signs all over that says no photography because their images have been objectified through art. And it's just not your piece. It's a lot of different people that have done that with her. And that's, that's like a relative, um, a distant relative, but. I don't think I would have, I wouldn't be happy if someone used my grandfather as an image saying, oh, look at this native man. He's so stoic. Um, I, I don't know. It's just very hurtful. Nada, you had your hand up. Did you have something well, more to say? Well, I'm not sure I had my hand up. Maybe I think it was scratching, but I did. <laughs> but I, um, I'm wondering if you think that visual art is, um, if there's more latitude, say, in literature for, I mean, for, people embodying other characters than there is in visual art because um, like the whole history of literature is 
and fortunately now more voices are being heard, but even the simple thing about like, an, I can always tell when I'm reading a novel and it's a man being a woman, for example, <laughs> I mean, just that simple thing. And so is there more latitude, I guess, in literature than in visual art? It, it appears to me that the answer to this question is as varied as the individuals in this panel and even more so. I know, you know that I've appropriated in the other direction. Mm -hmm. I've appropriated back. I've gone and appropriated them after they've appropriated us and done it in a funny kind of a way. So people kind of laugh and then they go, oh, wait a minute. And I've gotten a lot of heat about it mm. uh, from all different kinds of people. So yeah. People in my own community, <laughs> people outside of my community, all different types of people get, uh, can be offended. First they laugh and then they realize that they've been offended and then I get, then I get swapped. But, it, it, but they laugh first because they're kind of like, wait a minute, there's something wrong with Elvis. Who is that? There's something wrong with Elvis. Because <laughs> I, I appropriated Elvis, I appropriated the Queen, I appropriated all the presidents, I appropriated, I've appropriated the White House. I've appropriated everything as a, as a, as a gesture to take back history, to take back culture, to take back uh, the story, to take back the storyline. Yes. Uh, Linda Ronstadt came to my solo and, I, and she, she was very kind and very gracious. And we were looking at the Elvis Presley as a really cute brown guy. I mean, he was a really cute brown guy. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, can you imagine what the history of music would be like if Elvis Presley had been Mexican? And she goes, because she is half Mexican, right? She goes, mm -hmm. tell me about it. Mm -hmm. So appropriation I, for myself personally, I mean, I, I'm, I'm appropriating left and right but I'm appropriating backwards, if you will, or forwards, if you like yeah. Yeah. forwards. Yeah. And, um, but I like the second part of this question very much because I think that it's really the key to this is, can you be an ally and make work with integrity? Now, this is a very big question and I've seen this. Uh, I mean, so you have say a filmmaker who goes into the Amazon mm -hmm. and does a film on the people of the Amazon and uh, you, you have any, any number of uh, case scenarios where you have someone who's abusive to the people, you have someone who's respectful to the people, you have someone who's a great filmmaker who makes something that becomes like an award-winning film and, and suddenly draws attention to the, the political strife of the people. I mean, any number of scenarios are possible. But uh, you know, if you were an artist, would you choose to use information to make a point. And I think that's what this question is all about. Can you make that point with integrity? I mean, even Mariana is, is, is appropriating all this data. She's appropriating I, all this data. I'm appropriating data too. Yeah. 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 Well, I think, I think you can if there's participation, if there's that you know, genuine participation and working collectively together to do something. And that's where literature kind of falls down and doesn't they don't care to do that because you want one author that wants all the attention because of their their creative outlet but their creative outlet came from someone else but they won't offer that participation and give the you know credit to the people that they've worked with they'll gather all that information and then they'll create it and then they'll sell it and then they i'd like to make another point on that as well and that is that i've seen is this is good, right? This is a really good question. I've seen individuals that represent a specific community, right? It could be any number of communities that use that community in terms of information and inspiration and image that don't use it with integrity, even though they are from that community. Yes, that. yes, I have too. <laughs> yes, we all have, where you have people who are uh, pretend to be something uh, for the sake of an audience or for the sake of sales or this, that, the other. So that's why this question is so important. Can one be an ally and make work with integrity, whether you're inside your own community, whether it's the feminist community or the Native American or the Latino Americano, right, or the science community? Can you do that with integrity? And I think that the, 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 the key word to this is integrity. Integrity, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of the integrity is also participation and working collectively. That's mm -hmm. part of the integrity. So it can. Um, but again, that's such a loaded question that just goes, mm -hmm. it has various different layers. I mean, through art, through um, filmmaking, through literature, through every, it, 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 it can be redefined in different aspects. But yeah, but integrity in working and participation, I think, working collectively and participation. 
I, I'm, I'm going to add a caveat to it. I, <laughs> I'm going to add the caveat to this because this is very important to me, is that I have been uh, castigated by my own people for what I do. And I know that each one of us has found, you know, individuals that go, why are you doing that? Why did you do that? That's not right. Why did you do that? Uh, one, of, one of them that I got, which I always talk about because it's, a, it's a, good, a good story and it's a good joke is someone said to me, why you got to make them so dark? <laughs> I, I think you know ask me that why you got to make them so dark and yeah. I, I have a joke come back because it's such a loaded question I say well what I, I like them short and dark what are you going to do <laughs> See, I I did, like, and then somebody some guy at the back of the, of the, of the, of the panel is going yeah <laughs> I think I think what I've gotten is more from my community is I don't understand it I don't get it maybe if you put mm. a feather in their hair maybe if you painted their faces I'm like but that oh, my yeah. whole work is a it's, it's countering that that's exactly right so you can even get these questions from inside of your community and outside of it yeah Elad, have you you said that you get questions about why did you do the uh the uh passport yeah, of course. And, and you know, it's always like, okay, well, why don't you go back to your country? If you have so much shit to say about, you know, U.S. policy, you know, why don't you go back to your country? And of course, that's like the, the obvious, right? Yeah. And um, if you're paying, if you had any sense about what this work is actually saying, you recognize that that's precisely what it's talking about, you know, about uh, what, what's gotten missed, what's fallen in between, what's not understood, mm -hmm. how all of these images relate to each other, mm -hmm. how this is an ongoing narrative for yes. people of color in the United States. And, you know, ultimately, like I said, I found it very problematic to use mm -hmm. the Obi woman's image in yeah. as the bearer of the passport. Yeah. Also, there's nobody else that is American other than the Native American. That's the real American, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nobody else that should take that place. It's a place of honor and it's a place of respect. So, I mean, the whole thing is problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Mariana, did you have something to say? Well, that question of go back to your own country, it, it asking, you know, it, whose country is this? <laughs> is the question. Also, if, what, what, what? Native you know, Americans. <laughs> What stolen land are we on? Right, exactly. So I'm, not, I'm for all reparations. How can we pay back? How can we re, re, re make reparations for, for all the people we have injured and the people who have, we've taken there? Here we are in the middle of, of the land. Give our stole. land back. <laughs> right, exactly. Give our land back. Yes, yes. All yes. right. <laughs> oh. maybe, how about maybe, how about done, okay. kind of compensation, money, to people so that they can make up for the fact that they've had all those things stolen and that, that if they had if they had been compensated early on in their in their history they would be in a far better different place than than they are at this moment and, and stories the stories of reparation would break your heart if you allowed Pamela to tell you some stories and some of the stories that I know if you heard about the 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 the, the trials of reparation, you would, you would be, it's worse than anything you've ever heard. And I heard it from the people themselves. They told me the stories themselves. That's really an amazing thing. So we're doing really good. And I just want to remind our audience that it, we're going to do one more question. And then we're going to open up the chat for questions. And we're really hoping that this wonderful conversation will guide you in asking some good questions. So I'm going to ask one more question of the panel that they presented to me. And then I'm going to be reading your questions from the chat. And we'll continue from there. We still have about 25 minutes, ladies. Um, we've done a very good job on the first three questions. Nada, were you happy with the responses to that great question of yours? Yeah, it, it was, yeah. I thought it was <laughs> it's a really all helpful. Good. You know, it's a complicated subject. And um, well, I, you think know, it's, I think a scholar should take it on. That's what I think, a scholar yeah. should. Yeah. It. Let a scholar write about it. That's my whole thing. Let the scholars right. write about it. That's, that's my whole campaign is to get scholars to write about my work. Okay, so this last question, I think Mariana did present it, yeah. am I correct? What is your process? Where do your ideas come from? And how do, you, how do you make them an artistic reality? So what we're talking about is artistic process. Mm -hmm. Artistic process. Would someone like to begin, Mariana? How about you? Well, since I asked that question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in awe of the whole creative process. For me, um, 
I, um, I, I, my illustrated histories are a, a, a kind of an eclectic uh, mix of all kinds of topics so that I'm, I'm interested in everything. So I'm always taking in and I'm reading papers and I'm listening to the radio and I'm, I'm uh, uh, noting things and taking clippings and, and then uh, suddenly, uh, but I put them away, but I don't do anything with them. And then suddenly I'll, I'll uh, wake up in the morning and something will be in my head going, that's it. Or I'll get, I, I take notes in the middle of the night in the dark yeah. and uh, <laughs> yeah. I write in the dark. You have to write your letters very big and um, with ideas that come to me um, and you wonder, I wonder, you know, like the subconscious, there's something there uh, percolating at all times in, in the process. And um, sometimes those notes are really something in the morning when I look at them and other times they're not, I just toss them out. But um, uh, so that process is, is uh, interesting for me. I mean, yes. that's, that sounds like the, that sounds like the the quintessential artistic process, which is basically <laughs> just a a very big stew, and you just keep throwing things into the pot, and all of a sudden something floats to the top, yes. and you go, "Oh, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll do that." Yes, exactly. Anybody else? I'll start. I'll start. Oh, oh go ahead. Um, I, I my my process is my life experience. Um, I get ideas from just talking with people. I get I get inspired actually by other photographers. Um, a lot of my work is really um, it, it it was really inspired by um, this photographer called Horace um, Pola, who was Kiowa, and he documented um, members from his tribe in Oklahoma back in the 1920s to the 1990s. And Cena's work is very similar to what I'm doing, but he was a huge inspiration. And um, Zig Jackson, Zig Jackson, um, he did, you know, kind of very similar to what I'm doing with Indians in the city, but he did it up in San Francisco back in the 90s. Oh, yeah. And he's, his photography is represented in the Library of Congress. And he was the first Native American um, photographer who his, his, his photography is documented there. Um, Wendy, how do you get, how do you get your participants to participate, Pamela? How do you find I just them? asked them. I just asked them. I, I've known them for years. Um, I've lived here um, in, in the cities for over 30 years. And so a lot of them, I've, I've seen them grow up. And um, there's a large Native American community here in Los Angeles that a lot of people don't know about. And I used to work at the Southern California Indian Center. I work at UCLA and the American Indian Studies Center. So I'm, I'm always around Native people. So um, I, I, I listen to them and I hear them. I build relationships with them and they're part of my stories. And I, I, I want people to see us and hear us and see us in these like dignified ways and see that we are creative, that we have stories of living here in the city as opposed to on the plains. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's so many different photographers that really inspire it's inspire me and um, I love the black and white photography, um, which is what Zig Jackson did. Um, there's, there's quite a few native photographers that I've just really ad admired and, and learned about. And the, Will Wilson, he works with an old fashioned um, large format camera and his work is phenomenal. He's from my tribe. Mercedes Dorme, um, she's Tongva. And she um, documents about her tribe here in, in Los Angeles. And they're, they're, it's just the desire to produce, you know, results that I feel like can change the perception of how people see us. And so that's kind of my process is really, I, I want change and I want to share, you know, contemporary stories. Nada. Well, I mean, I guess I have more general comments about the artistic process, but I think it will be interesting to do a show of people of people's 
pieces that are in between bodies of work because sometimes I'll make a piece and I'll be like, it won't fit into anything, but I can't let it go. And sometimes it will be like years before I will resolve it and come back to it. But um, I mean, I, I, you know, I guess, I guess like, so you might start out with an intention, but part of the process is to allow that to evolve to a place that you might not have expected. And I think that that's the process that we as artists um, can learn from our own work. So, I love um, that. I just love yeah. that. Because, you know, my process involves a lot of experimentation. Like I'll get a crazy idea and I'll go, gee, I wonder how I'll do that. <laughs> and then I'll go buy the supplies and see if I can make it happen. And so, as you can see in the table behind me, there's all these things that are sort of happening. And they, one day the puzzle just kind of comes together and there's the piece. And so it's always this... Uh, half done stuff all over all over the place and those sometimes aren't your best pieces those weird in between pieces but they're like the most inspiring kinds of things i, mean, I sometimes me. i feel that in terms of my process that the place the space in between is the space i like right. as an artist the best right i agree uh, but my friend calls it the becoming uh -huh. the becoming where you're 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 creating it's the creative space in between that's, that's the most fun in terms of being an artist mm -hmm. because to finalize an object and to put the last little dot on it and to make sure that it's perfectly cut or all this stuff is, you know, is, all that technical stuff isn't so much fun. Whereas the, the, the conceptual part. The birth the, of an idea. <laughs> the idea, yeah, the becoming. And I really like that word a lot. And uh, I enjoy, a lot of artists are afraid of the becoming so they can't change their object. Their object is always the same because they're afraid of the becoming because it's actually a void. It's like a void. Mm -hmm. You can feel like weightless. And, but I love it there. I just love it there. I love the becoming. I love Me it too. There. I, li I liked in your um, statement how you talked about how the brown dot piece is being very strenuous. I thought that was kind of an interesting, like once you've sort of decided what to do, how kind of strenuous. Well, there I am dotting <laughs> tens of thousands of dots by hand on these pieces. It was just insane. Yeah. Vlad, do you have something to share about your process? Like, from what you were just saying, I was thinking about how obsessive that is, right? And I have, <laughs> I have certain pieces that are like exactly that, and I get off on it, and I, I live for it, and it's like a point of meditation. And, you know, I, I mm -hmm. definitely get obsessive about my work, where I wake up thinking about it, I eat thinking about it, I go to sleep thinking about it, you know? And I generally fall into a rabbit hole just like consuming it and like really questioning myself questioning the motives the intentions like experimenting um mm -hmm. trying different uh you know textures or patterns and then finally like i'll find a kernel of what it's becoming in the process of it you know yeah, yeah. and it just um it's like this mystery that's unfolding I found out recently, excuse me, Mariana, I found out recently that uh, that's what curators, that's the conversation that curators really love to have. That's the conversation mm -hmm. that they really enjoy the having process. in the studio is the becoming. That's where they, they like to be in the becoming. They like mm -hmm. to be invited in to the becoming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found a lot of uh, curators, I have a really wonderful uh, experiences with curators because I welcome them into the space that Nate is talking about where there's stuff everywhere and some stuff is not quite and this is not quite and that's not quite and you're 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 walking them into what what Pilar called this void. Uh, Mariana, you had something to add. Oh yeah, I was gonna say uh, don't throw anything away ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah, well, because sometimes you have these things that look like a dead end, and then you, uh, for me, uh, uh, they're kicking around and kicking around for so long, you're putting them in the closet, and then someday you get it out, and you go, oh, wait a minute now, that's not, not as bad as I thought it was. And um, it, oh, I know it, how to use that. I know how to use that. Yeah, right, right. And you go, no, yeah, right. And, and, it, and I'm so glad I didn't throw it away. Then I think about some of the things I did throw away I should have never done. So now I'm just holding on to everything I possibly can so that it does not, it, 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 it's ma there's a magic there that, that you're not perceiving at the moment that you think it's nothing. I, I recently had an archives come to visit the studio and um, I, uh, you know, I have everything all over the place and welcome them into the, into the becoming and the void. I welcome them into the void. I don't let artists into my studio because they confuse my process. But curators, I will allow into the space. 
you know, because there's shows, there's shows, there's, there's articles, there's shows, there's publications, there's opportunities. But artists, sometimes it gets too confusing because I'm mixing their becoming with my becoming and then I get all confused. But I was, I, there was a few things on the table that didn't work and I had torn them in half. And the, the historian, the, the historian and the archivist said, Linda, don't ever do that again. That's what we want is the mistakes. Hmm. That's what we want to collect is the stuff that Nate is talking about. This stuff that's sort of in between that shows the, the jumping off, the jumping off place to the next, the next image or the next idea. Wonderful. Any more comments about this? Well, let's see if we have some uh, questions from our audience. We're doing really good. It's just about eight, 18. How's everybody, how's everybody feeling? One from Beverly Nidus. You might want to take a quick look and- Why don't you, why don't you share that with us, Sandra? Uh, I can, yeah, I'll do it. And then maybe we'll bring her to the conversation. She's asking, um, I'm curious uh, whether, oops. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm curious whether any of the artists have worked with activist groups um, not so much to illustrate or decorate protests, but rather to develop cultural strategies to create awareness and conversations about the social, social issues. And many of the artists, since most of the artists do gallery work, I'm wondering whether they get frustrated with that cultural context and have done guerrilla interventions in public spaces with artist peers or community members. So the first part is if we've worked with, uh, if you've worked with activist groups in developing um, cultural strategies. Oh, well, let's stop there. Let's let's stop there then, because okay. work with cultural groups to create strategies. Yeah, activist groups. Whether Activ you have activist issues, groups. have you gone out to the groups that are also working on the issues mm -hmm. to do a project with them? Mm -hmm. I think, Beverly, maybe I'll just. Anybody? I mean, I have in like the before time, um, but I mean, I, I do think that showing in a gallery can be problematic. I mean, it's kind of what I said about like, for the first time I did something that I would, could share directly. That's not what you're asking. I mean, I'd like 30 years ago, I used to do more things like that with um, kind of working out and I feel like I could return to it. Um, but um, I think the context for work, um, I mean, it would be, I mean, that's, I guess that's a difference between social practice work where your people are out there, like, you know, the guy that went to New Orleans and did like re, reprogram waiting for Godot or where you're spending like a lot of um, kind of ambiguous kinds of social practice work. And that's, I mean, we, we aren't doing social practice work, most of us. And so I think, you know, I think that social practice work can be really, really powerful and it does get the work out of the gallery. Um, so that's, yeah. yeah so it's, no, I, I, and I, uh, sounds a lot like what Beverly Natives does. She's the one who asked the question. So um, I know that it's out there and I, I haven't participated, but um, there's, a, you know, she has a website, is it Art for Change, uh, that uh, you might wanna check out for people who are watching. What you mentioned that. before. <laughs> That's yeah, what I mentioned at the beginning group. of our talk, yes. It's a Do Facebook they? group that's, um, you know, it's based on the book that I wrote, Arts for Change, Teaching Outside the Frame. And um, it's, I think it's really important for artists to know that there are multiple ways to bring social engagement into their work. Um, there's nothing wrong with using the gallery as a context to find an audience, but I, at some point, earlier in my career got frustrated with that being the only venue where I was mm -hmm. able to reach people because it was a limited space um, and started making work in the street and working collaboratively. So I was just curious whether any of the artists here had that same experience where I'm not finding the audience I, I want and need in the gallery I need to work collaboratively with activist groups who have issues, who are working on the issues that are embedded in my work and find ways of reaching audiences in new ways. So. I might agree with Nada that I was doing more, um, actually a lot of the work that I was doing would 
was not at that time coined as public practice in the 70s and the 80s. Mm. It wasn't coined as public practice, but it was public practice. Public practice was uh, is still alive and well in the Mexicano, Chicano, Latinx, Chicanx communities. It's been there for quite some time and uh, what work as activism has been a part of that particular conversation for a long time. Um, and I was happy to be a part of it and understand the limitations of the gallery world, believe me. But what I've decided, and I still, I still continue with some of that work, but it's a much more private level. In terms of my personal image now, I'm more uh, interested in um, university exhibitions and uh, regional and national museum exhibitions. And I find that I'm, I am satisfied with the level of uh, communication that I have with uh, visitors uh, through panels and education programs. And that, that does satisfy my need for an audience. Um, I found for myself that in the 70s and 80s when I was involved in what we will coin as public practice, that my audience was much what Mariana was talking about, that I was, you know, speaking to, I was talking to the choir, I was preaching to the choir. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to leave that particular orientation because I felt that I need to try my best to take my imagery out to a, a larger, more diverse audience. Thanks. Um, I will say that back in the 90s, I was part of a group called the Artist Network and it had ties with the RCP. And we definitely had a lot of programming happening to have a visual impact on you know whatever protests were happening at the time and also we managed to put together like an international call for graphics protest graphics that would be part of an artist um, major concert against the war um, so there's that and then there's also my ongoing work that I do with spark uh, murals that we engaged in community um, murals and a lot of workshops that happen with the community specifically to represent the vision that they have for um, for themselves and how they want to represent themselves in their community and you know so we've done different projects in watts and and throughout la and also in i think it was 2019 last year that we had the um we created so much artwork from skip script screen printing to um, painting on parachutes that became a part of the uh, Teachers Union March in downtown LA, which was incredible, um, the way that the, the work opened up and really um, captured the spirit. So there's always been that um, sort of activation in my work and um, my working community. And uh, I never really intended to be in the gallery, but I get approached to be in the gallery and the majority of the time I, you know, like for example, this passport piece, I can't sell that piece. That was never the intention. Like I said, it was never even the intention for it to go viral and go public in that way, you know? So it's interesting how things um, evolve. You never know. Uh, Sandra, do we have another question? I think Naida wanted to say something. Oh, no, Naida. Well, I, yeah, I just wanted to say that kind of adding the word art to social and political um, can complicate things because in order to be considered art, it usually has to conform to the rules of like art history or context. And um, so like social and political sort of, I guess political or social practice can kind of be in this artistic like purgatory where it's not quite this, it's not quite that. So, I, you know, I think it's very super valuable. There's some amazing projects, but you know, I think you have to decide as an artist, you know, what your path is and, and it could change. But um, I think just, I guess my point was you, putting the word art next to social and political makes it like this really complicated practice, I think, on some level. I'm finding that it's I, changing. I'm finding that it's changing. I'm, I'm okay. finding very strongly that it's changing very quickly. And uh, the, the reason why I say it is because there's been a great deal of interest in my work. And I find that there's a lot of scholars and uh, curators who are interested in bringing these kinds of conversations to their to their to their institutions because they re it really helps to engage audiences on different levels. And um, I'm hoping that this trend will continue. 
that there is an interest in, 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 in the shift where art can be combined with socio-political, where art can be combined with cultural, which is another, that the politics of culture is a whole other thing as well. But I, I'm very hopeful. It's always, I, think. I, I feel like it's always been, you know, it's only that like what um, part of uh, what you're saying is that it's not recognized by the art world, but just because it's not recognized by the art world doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Oh, you no, know? I'm not saying, no. yeah, I'm not on that side either. Yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, um, yeah, that it's a great, it seems to be a gray area. I mean, people, well, yeah, it's... <laughs> It seems really complicated to me, but I'm a big fan of really deep social practice work. I'm a, you know, I think that people that go out and make the, whether they're di seemingly too didactic or more ambiguous, fun, kind of playful things like the group that went and did the airport out in Nevada, or, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, where it was like sort of, sort of this weird, ambiguous kind of thing. I can't remember the name or like, you know, like the yes men that go into communities and make, I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. powerful work. So I'm not on that side of galleries, but I'm just saying that because they're basically retail stores. So I'm just saying that it's, you know, it's a complicated, it's complicated, I guess, for an individual artist. And you have to make a living too, as an artist, you know, all this stuff takes a like money to do. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I think we have another question from another audience member, uh, uh, Sandra. Yeah, there was uh, an earlier question uh, from uh, Gabriel Ortiz, and he asked, is it categorically bad for a white person to use a tomahawk or a war bonnet in art? Isn't it conceivable that that could be used in a way that could benefit Native American community? I like the way he uses the word categorically. <laughs> this is a, he wants a definitive answer here and I don't know um, no question. just don't do it just don't do it please um, you know, there's, a, there's even something worse Pamela it's when they, when they make one it's not yeah. the real one but they make one it's nothing like the real one and then they broadcast misinformation on top of appropriation yeah I think just also just going back to the last question for me, um, I'm being Native American is political. We're we're basically you know in the past we were, we were divine, we were defined as political prisoners of the United States of this white patriarch society. Um, for me, I. I come from a sovereign nation, so I use my sovereign ability to do the artwork. So I think I can't, I can't not do work that's not political. My whole life is around political and policies that has, you know, the government has defined me as. So I guess as an artist, I am always going to be a political artist, but that's just for me. That's how I, I do the work that I do. And it's always going to be political. Um, I do sit, you know, I've, I've, I've protested at, you know, Standing Rock. I protested against the, the, the mascots. Um, you know, I've helped with, you know, part of, you know, helping with um, Los Angeles, you know, bringing Indigenous Peoples Day to fruition. Um, I've helped with, you know, people really advocating land acknowledgement by, by cities and um, it, it's ongoing. It, it, I think with all the work that I'm doing, it's really, it's, it's always going to be political in my eyes. And I think in people that see my work, it is going to be political. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, I think there was another question still from um, I'm not sure that there is. Um, I saw one. Uh, go from, ahead and ask it if you saw I think it was Sheila. I think it was Sheila Pinkle. Okay. Asked, uh, do you think that the ability to Zoom? Oh, it's right here. Yes. Can you read it for me, please? That, do you think that the ability to Zoom has enhanced our ability to significantly extend the dialogue of art outside the gallery? I think so. I think um, 
you're giving you're getting a different kind of audience you're getting you know people from other states i think i just saw someone that was um tuning in from wisconsin um i have three of my friends that are you know from montana nevada that are able to see and um view different people's work i think it 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 does it gives um a larger audience and new audience to really understand your your work that's i mean that's what i've seen through um a lot of the zoom events and i've i participated in a lot of zoom events that i normally wouldn't know about or go to because they were somewhere else more comments i'm a i'm a zoom virgin so this is my first <laughs> A large uh, uh, panel, uh, and I have Zoom with friends. So, um, I, yeah, I think there's a potential there that uh, uh, that we can all take care, take uh, advantage of. Yeah, how are you experiencing it, Pilar? Are you enjoying Zoom? I hate Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you hate Zoom? <laughs> um, Oh, you know, I think to answer the question, it's yes. This is the reason that we're here, right? It does open up the possibilities for other people across to, to join in, you know, and that's really cool. But nothing beats the exchange of having a warm conversation, of having an in-person conversation, of being able to look at you in the present, in your eyes, and, you know, talk to you after this panel is over, Pamela, to, like, get some understanding and reasoning, you know what I mean? Like, nothing will replace that. So, and yeah, that person to person contact so that when you're talking about your work and you're looking out and seeing people and they're nodding or they're making faces at you and you and then you can respond to it. And there's a real sense of, of community and, and to be able to be with another person to be a group of people. Of course, we haven't been with people for so long with this with this pandemic and everything. But um, I think that the Zoom is a good tool, but um, I really, really, I agree with Pilar. I really like to be with, um, in a space with people. Well, hopefully in a very <laughs> short time, we'll be able to be together in a place together and, uh, you know, be able to see each other for real. And, but I think that I want to thank each and each of you for joining us tonight, because I believe our conversation was very uh, interesting and provocative. And thank you for being so transparent and so sharing with the audience. Uh, it's uh, that we brought up a lot of really great questions that that need to be asked and need to be answered. And I'm hoping that this will encourage our audience to come out to the gallery by appointment and to see the work and know and know you and know your face and know your work when they do go visit and know something about what you're doing and why and how you do it. So Sandra, you want to say good night? Um, well, and Suvon, why don't you uh, show your face and share that we're our partnership. We really, really want to thank these artists. I mean, in some ways, this exhibition was built by Zoom. Um, the conversations we had with almost every person that participated really happened in this way. And we're this just to hear the richness of your sharing and, and you know, um, I want to allow Suvon to close this out because she's the one that really is the most articulate about the premise. But I will say that the exhibition itself has two overtly community pieces in it um, that involved together almost 100 artists um, that were brought into the gallery space. There, there's other work, including many of your own pieces. Um, you know, I think of Pamela, you know, a photographer, you're, you, you have a team, you're working with other people always. Uh, Kim Abley's with her shared skies. So anyway, it, there's no way this, this exhibition Common Ground could happen, I believe, as, a, as an individual show. It needed to be a group and spark a conversation. But Suvan, um, why don't you close us out and say thank you to... I just want to thank everybody who's on the panel and a very large thank you to Linda. This was absolutely marvelous, beautifully pulled together. The conversation was rich, it was layered. It was the kind of conversation I was hoping for. Part of the reason we, I wanted to do Common Ground wasn't just to create a, an exhibition with art tucked away in a gallery, but literally so we could get artists together to discuss the issues that are in our hearts. And this is a really important time. 
this is a really difficult, sweaty time that we're all living through right now. And I think that's wonderful because, you know, it's, it, I keep thinking of it as a growth spurt. spurt. Something is happening. Something is, you know, and when I look around and I see what people are pushing for in their lives, both directions, this is the kind of movement that uh, change comes out of. And I get very hopeful. So this panel discussion was part of dear and, dear and deep into my heart. So thank you so much, every one of you. And thank everybody who uh, attended. We had a lot of attendees and um, from the comments that are on the chat, you, you guys knocked it out of the park. Thank you.